Hey guys, we are here in Winchester, Indiana, having a good time, and Andrew is here with a really cool airplane. We're going to do another like pre-flight walk around. Andrew's going to do his magic and have a lot of fun telling us everything about it. But uh, Andrew, how you doing? Good, good. That's a beautiful morning. We've got a beautiful airplane. So far, so good. We came all the way from Zanesville, Ohio to Winchester, Indiana thus far in the last week and hoping to get up to Oshkosh to the big air show, show off the airplane. This is a 1936 Aranka LB. It's a very rare airplane. We think there's about seven of them surviving out of about 50 or 60 that were built. And this is the only one right now that's flyable. Uh, there's one in Washington State that flew about five years ago and could be made flyable, but it hasn't flown in five years. So right now, this is the only low-wing Aranka flyable in the world. And uh, uh, it was owned by a friend of ours named Jack Tiffany, who started the restoration on it. Uh, he eventually passed away before he finished it, and so another friend of ours, Paul Workman, finished the restoration in Zanesville, Ohio, about a month ago. It was the first flight since 1961. And uh, so I, clearly it's a very rare airplane. As I said, about 50 or 60 of them were built. This is the only one currently flying. And uh, it, it was a departure for the Aranka company in 1936. Aranka was known for what we kind of call flying flivers. They had the Ronca C3, the, the flying bathtub had a kind of a fat bulbous fuselage, but it was a very light airplane, only had a 36 horsepower engine. And uh, about the time they were coming out with this airplane, they started a Ronca Ks, which were K KCAs. Ronca K had also had the 37 horsepower engine, a little bit more advanced, but they were, they were into light airplanes. Oh, here comes our interruption of the day. Jim and his Waco. So, they decided for some reason they wanted to build a kind of a more advanced airplane and something sleek and it was very unusual for its time to have a light airplane with a low wing. Most of the light airplanes had high wings or were biplanes back then. So it was very unusual to have a low wing, uh, very advanced looking and kind of aimed for more of a higher end sportsman pilot I think was, was the idea of the Aranka, the low wing Aranka. Uh, they originally actually tried it with a 37 horsepower engine and apparently it staggered into the air a few feet and that was about it. So then they started putting on these Leblanc radial engines. This is an 85 horsepower Leblanc. The first ones had 70 horsepower Leblancs, the model LA. This is an LB with an 85 horse Leblanc. And then they made the LC with a 90 horsepower Warner. But uh, it, it was the middle of the depression. It was kind of an advanced airplane. Uh, they didn't they didn't really sell that well and so they only built them for a couple years and again only made about 50 or 60. Uh, it's it's a very classic 1930s kind of art deco uh, smile and jack cartoon look to it uh, the, the ring cowl around the engine uh, the the spats they call them spats on the wheels that, that fare in the wheels to streamline the wheels are kind of unusual. A lot of airplanes had wheel pants where they fared just around the wheel, but these big fairings that go all the way up to the wing were kind of unusual back then. Uh, it, it has a kind of a look of a car with a car door, the great big door that you can get into. Uh, something again, kind of a higher end type of uh, type of an airplane. Uh, it's made for two people. Two 1936 size people. You get two 2018 size people in it. It's uh, it's a little bit tight, but uh, but it was a fairly efficient. It was a good airplane. It flies pretty well. It's not a ball of fire or a rocket ship or anything, but it does fly pretty well. And they, they've been giving me a little bit of a hassle because people said, well, on a scale of one to ten, how does it fly? And I said, well, it's about a six, which to me is above average. But uh, I, you know, for as sleek as it looks, I think people thought it should fly better. But it, I said it was also, it's a 10 out of 10 at the gas pumps, because when you pull up to the gas pumps in this, you're the coolest airplane on the airport. The Aranka, this low-wing Aranka, was the 140th different type of airplane that I've flown. And uh, so it, it gives me kind of a perspective on it and be able to, be able to compare it. Uh, it's, it's 
kind of near the top of the list really a lot of it because of the coolness factor just because it's a low wing aranka and it looks so cool and it's so classic we, we were joking when we first started flying it that you're not allowed to fly it unless you have a fedora or a golf cap kind of newsboy cap kind of thing on it we were going to rent them anybody wanted to go for a ride had to rent a fedora it goes about 85 or 90 miles an hour not a not very fast but uh for that day was certainly a very adequate cruise speed it has this 85 horsepower leblanc burns about five gallons an hour it carries 28 gallons of gas there's a, a fuel tank in the wing that you can see the red cap right there on the wing walk it carries there's 19 gallons in there and then up in the nose there's a nine gallon tank the fuel system there's a little engine driven fuel pump on the tack drive on the back of the engine kind of unusual and it all it does is it pumps fuel from the wing tank up into the nose tank and then it gravity feeds from there back to the engine so or down to the engine uh, if it overfills there's an overflow that that feeds the fuel back to the main tank if the nose tank over overflows uh, so it's uh, you know five hours of fuel it's a long range at 90 miles an hour five hours of fuel you know well over 400 miles you could go if you wanted to it's really not that comfortable for somebody as big as i am so two hours in it is probably about as much as i'll ever want to do but uh uh pretty practical airplane they use a few parts that they had the tails are basically the straight off the aranka k or the early aranka chief the same thing they were already building uh it's uh it weighs about a thousand and sixty pounds i think is the empty weight uh, plus fuel and people and oil and stuff so a uh, little bit heavy for a light airplane but uh, but it does okay it has a big wing it has a tapered wing where the wing is very wide at the root and very, and much narrower at the tip and that can be a problem as far as uh, the the aerodynamic stall characteristics the first time we flew it uh, we didn't have the aileron seal there's uh, the small gap between the aileron and the wing but it's enough that air can bleed through there and can create problems and the the very first flight when i did the first stall it, it tried to snap roll it really uh, had a very harsh stall not much warning and it really was uh, it tried to it, the right wing went down and it basically tried to snap roll we sealed the ailerons up which also makes them work better that's really the primary reason for doing it but as it turned out it made the stall more docile also so if you if it stalls pretty docile now if you hold it in and keep the stick back and it, it eventually will break and drop a wing but it's uh it really improved it to seal to do the gap seals on the ailerons and uh other than that it's a fairly conventional flying airplane it uh it's pretty it's pretty uh you know flies about like a lot of them really all right here's the cockpit of the low wing aranka great big door only on one side so the pilot has to get in first and the passenger can get in after that uh, again, it's by the standards of the day, it's fairly roomy. Nowadays, uh, bigger people, it's a little bit tighter. Fairly simple, typical cockpit, the usual instruments, nothing fancy in there. Throttle in the center, the switch on the left, uh, the fuel valve next to the switch, uh, the usual set of instruments and things. A couple of unusual things on the left hand side. Uh, this is the trim, which that's normal. The flap is on the belly of the airplane between the landing gear. It's basically just a drag flap, and uh, we'll demonstrate the operation of that. But it works, it's a, it's a Model A window crank that, that actuates it. And uh, on the, the other thing is this red uh, disc there with the yellow writing on it, uh, the fuel always pumps from the wing tank up to the nose tank. And there could be situations where you don't want that. If you had a fuel leak or if you, your pump's working too much and it's pumping, it's overflowing the nose tank, you tear that off and there's a valve behind it you can shut off the valve so that it can't go from the wing tank to the nose tank anymore so that's kind of unusual but other than that two sticks again fairly typical uh, full set of four rudder pedals dual rudder pedals it has brakes on it the original one had cable operated brakes uh, they weren't very efficient this one has been one of the one of the safety things that has been been done to this airplane is to put hydraulic brakes on it uh, so they work well and makes it a little bit safer and this big lever over here is a parking brake which i don't tend to use parking brakes you always wonder if you leave it on accidentally and try to land with it it could be a problem so i, I generally don't use the parking brake all right th this is another interesting part of the airplane a lot of people ask what it is some people think it's a handle or something but it's a it's a lead weight it's a counterbalance it's a static balance for the ailerons the airplane is listed as a maximum speed of 162 miles an hour, which seems like you'd have to dive it straight down to do that. But at high speeds, 
if all of the weight of a movable surface like this aileron is behind the hinge point, you can get a, a condition called flutter, where it, it'll make lift on one side, then the other, and where it'll actually flutter and vibrate, and can actually tear the aileron off the airplane and do damage to the wing. So they put these counterbalance weights on there so that the the theory is that the center of balance of the aileron is exactly on the hinge and it prevents flutter but that's what these uh, that's what these red weights are for and it's original factory thing from 1936 so uh, another one of the kind of advanced features of the airplane all right this is the engine it's a five cylinder leblond 5df which is 85 horsepower. I'm not sure the cubic inches, they tend to be a lot larger cubic inches than an 85 horsepower engine would be nowadays because they turn a lower RPM. The red line RPM is about 2100, I think. 2100 or 2150 is the maximum RPM of this engine. It's a kind of a typical old 1930s engine. Uh, there's no oil to the overheads. Uh, there's little grease fittings up here that you have to squirt grease in every few hours. It's similar, if you, if you watched the fleet video that we did about the Fleet 10F, uh, it shows us greasing the rocker arms like that. And this is another engine, again, fairly typical of 1930s engines where you had to hand lube by greasing the overheads. It, it, uh, we had a little bit of problem when we first started running it. It was running very hot. The temperature probe was in this sump in the bottom. The sump is where the oil goes right before it goes back to the oil tank. And then the carburetor is bolted to the bottom of this sump so that it goes through hot air after the, the mixture, after it goes through the carburetor, goes through this heated part and it helps it to vaporize when it goes up into the engine and, and then to the carburetor. Uh, it seems to be a fairly powerful engine. Uh, I think 70 horsepower would have been marginal for this airplane, but 85 is pretty good. The 90 horsepower Warner, which was also a five cylinder engine would be even better. The engine was built in Cincinnati same as the airplane, and I think they probably had some kind of a professional relationship between the Leblanc engine company and Aranka. That's probably why they chose Leblanc's at first for the, uh, for the engine for this. Uh, th this is the pitot tube for the airspeed system. Uh, pitot static, it has a static line that's closed off that measures the static pressure. The pitot line measures the active pressure. The, this one is open at the front, so the air pushing in there uh, gets compared with the static air that's he that senses through tiny little holes in this one, and that's how the airspeed indicator works. It's kind of a weird spot for it on top of the wing like that, in the low pressure area from the wing, and in fact the airspeed indicator wobbles around sometimes, and I think it's because the air, the pressure over the top of the wing is, is making it act funny. Once in a while it'll go right down to zero, and sometimes if you tap on the gauge it'll jump up and start reading again, but I think it's because of the unusual location of the airspeed indicator, or the pitot tube I should say. And another interesting thing about this whole entire wing, the wing is one piece from this joint, which is about oh, six or seven feet from the fuselage. It's one piece from here all the way across to the other side, the same dimension out. And it's a cantilever wing, which means there's no bracing, there's no wires bracing it or struts bracing it, which was another unusual and advanced feature for 1936, especially for a light airplane to have a cantilever wing. It has two great big thick wooden spars, one up near the front there, one right back here. And, uh, and then the outer panels are only about, uh, again, eight or nine feet long, and they bolt on. They have great big bolts underneath, underneath this fairing strip that bolt the outer wing panels to the center wing panel. So uh, very strong and, uh, and, again, kind of unusual for a 1936 airplane. These are the ailerons. They're what we call a plain hinged aileron, where they just have a, a, like a piano hinge, they call it, in three different spots on the on the aileron it has a, a v-shaped gap underneath it where the aileron can close up and move back and forth so that it can go up and down uh, as, as we were talking about before there was an actual about a half inch gap between the wing and the aileron here and they work much better if you put these tapes on them and seal them so that's what uh, paul workman who restored the airplane after we did the first test flight we put these tapes on so we could see the improvement and it definitely improved the aileron effectiveness they're easier to move also and it made the stall a little bit better because you didn't have air leaking up over the top of the aileron the airplane is kind of a heat box it's kind of a greenhouse effect in it because of all these windows so it gets very hot in there we have this window that folds up so you have an open window on this side the window same window on the other side opens out a little bit to give you a little bit of fresh air let me shut the door here get that shut here's the 
wing tank is under the wing walk here that we were talking about 19 gallons in there this is the nose tank there's nine gallons in here it has a cork with a wire on it this little wire is connected to a cork you can see if I turn it sideways there and it has a series of little holes in it it's supposed to be one for each gallon there's nine holes it's nine gallons so that tells you the cork goes up and down and tells you how many gallons you have in your nose tank if if you're flying along it's it stays pretty steady uh, so far as if the fuel pump is matched to the fuel flow of the engine and uh, this wire doesn't actually go up and down very much if you run out of gas in your wing tank this wire will start going down and then you'll know you're out of gas in your wing tank and whatever this is is left this is almost two hours of gas so there's plenty of gas once it starts going down but but that's how that works this little thing is interesting we had to put an oil shutoff valve on it the oil kept draining down into the engine which sometimes happens with the old engines so this is connected to a valve inside so it sticks up and it has a big lettering on it so it tells you the oil is off if that's sticking up when you're sitting in the cockpit you can't miss it so you won't accidentally start the engine with the oil off which would be bad and then the oil tank is a two gallon oil tank right under the uh, cowling there 